good morning and welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Committee Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Bacchus. Present. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Here. Assemblywoman Howdigy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblyman Miller. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblyman Watts, here. Assemblyman Yeager, and Chair Monroe Marino. And I am here. Will you please mark Assemblyman Miller and Assemblyman Yeager present as they arrive. Members, we have a pretty long calendar today and we'll be taking a few things out of order. I'll remind all the members and those of you joining us in the audience to please mute or turn off all of your electronic devices. Um, if you are joining us and would like to um, submit public comment that will be at the end of today's meeting that call-in number is 888-475-4499 our meeting ID is 8199064-1751 and then please press pound I'll remind everyone that you have two minutes for public comments remember to state and spell your name for the record and with that we are going to get started because we have a long week ahead of us not just a long day a long week um, and we're going to take things a little bit out of order we're going to start with assembly bill 50 and invite the attorney general to the table good morning to you too Good, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Aaron Ford, your Attorney General. Uh, delighted to be here today to discuss Senate Bill 50. Um, I, here to request resources for the Office of Attorney General to engage in the fight against organized retail crime. Uh, I'll start with a quick overview of organized retail crime. I understand this is the money committee, not the policy committee, but I just want to give you an understanding of what we're asking for. Um, organized retail crime is, um, or um, ORC, as you may hear it called, refers to a criminal activity in which perpetrators target retailer stores to steal massive amounts of products and then resell the items in different venues, such as on the Internet. Uh, to be sure, we're not talking about shoplifters who steal items for personal use. We're talking about um, um, groups of individuals, oftentimes um, uh, um, organizations that are organizing this retail crime and then utilizing uh, their efforts to ultimately sell these sold products, again, over the Internet or maybe even sometimes out of warehouses. Assembly Bill 50 seeks to provide the Office of Attorney General jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute organized retail crime, counterfeit goods, and fraudulent transactions. Um, again, I know it's not customary for an agency to uh, be here to place a fiscal note on its own bill. Uh, however, conversation on this policy has evolved, um, as tends to happen in this building. And in lieu of creating a stakeholder committee uh, as the initial iteration of this bill as the second iteration of this bill called for, uh, we've instead submitted for an amendment requesting simply one senior deputy attorney general uh, to help us uh, for the purposes of prosecuting organized retail crime. Uh, that's what this um, um, fiscal note is about, and we respectfully request your uh, indulgence with that and the acceptance of it. I have with me my chief of staff, Teresa Benitez Thompson, who can also answer any questions you may have from the fiscal component. Thank you so much for the presentation. And yes, we do know that this is a growing issue in our communities throughout the state. So um, the appropriation um, was added into, amended in the policy committee for the appropriations needed. Um, the fiscal note you have, you, has, was that lowered going from the one person down? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, happy Memorial Day to you, Ways and Means Committee members, Chair Monroe Monreno, Teresa Benitez Thompson for the record. Um, so the, the number, and we would like permission to be able to work with staff on the number because we did do a floor amendment that augmented from the committee to the request for a staff person, and I believe we provided some preliminary numbers. Right now there's not existing staff as we don't have jurisdictional capability to do this in the office, so it would be for the establishment for that one senior deputy attorney general. In looking at the numbers with uh, my fiscal staff on Friday, it looked like we might have just put it in for a deputy attorney general versus a senior deputy attorney general but in conversations with our our chief the type of skill and that level that we would need would be someone who could function a little bit more autonomously since there there's only one of them 
um, in the in the state right now. So we those numbers, um, if we could just revisit them one last time, but they, it won't be a substantial swing. It's still just one the one position. Members, any questions? Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, uh, thank you, Attorney General and uh, former Assemblywoman. It's good to see you both. I really like this bill today, um, and I'm sorry. I just I don't have the fiscal note. Um, it wasn't provided. Is it just the appropriation that we're discussing? Okay, so just the amount that's in the the actual bill language. There's not an additional fiscal note. Um, and then and then if I may just ask one follow up. Uh, I know that across the whole state agencies, we've got massive vacancies. Do you guys feel that you'll be able to hire this position? Um, thank you so much, Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff, through Chair Monroe Moreno to Assemblyman Hafen. We do, I think we feel even more confident with the proposed um, pay bill that has been put forth. And so um, we see our office vacancy hovering around 14% right now, and we're very enthusiastic about the fact that that will take, we believe, a steep, a steep drop with the considerations that you folks have put forward. Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. Good to see you too. Um, in in Section One Five, and in a couple, this might be a little more policy. But why is it um, that Attorney General may instead of shall investigate? Uh, thank you so much for the question to Assemblyman Dickman through Chair Monroe Moreno. So it's so that we... Exactly to the member. Thank That's you okay. so much. So it's the jurisdictional ability, and so it's that we may be able to go forth and prosecute it. Right now these cases are uh, as well prosecuted um, by the district attorneys at the local level. Um, they are, and you'll hear testimony to the fact they've got a lot more than they can handle. So this will give us the ability to approach and to prosecute, um, but it, it will make sure that the jurisdictional, um, the sharing of that jurisdiction remains where it is now between um, your your local DAs and then the state coming in to be a participant as well. Got it, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Bacchus. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and, and you may have already just kind of touched on this. I was curious because um, moving from the DA's handling a lot of these matters up to the Attorney General, with having a senior Deputy Attorney General, um, is that going to be able to handle it? I see that person will then be responsible for like all levels, investigation, um, as well as the prosecution, or do you already have staff um, available like investigators to assist the senior um, Deputy Attorney General? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Uh, Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford through Chairman Ro Moreno to Assemblywoman Bacchus. So um, right now the Office of the Attorney General does not do prosecution or investigations in this area. We're looking for the jurisdiction to do both and then for the resources for, for prosecution. We looked at the, what the resources would meet mean for investigation and it's a it would be a pretty big build out so at this time what we're looking for is just the ability to help prosecute um, and then we imagine that as we go forward and engage in this work we would probably be able to come back next session and talk about the work we've been able to done but do but also where we might be able to grow out and that would most certainly be in the investigatory spot any follow-up Thank you. Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so if, if we give you the authority to investigate and prosecute, I know in past times the Attorney General said that the local counties have to pay for them to come in and technically handle the county's work. Would that still be the course or is that going by the wayside? Uh, thank you for the question. Aaron Ford, for the record. I, I believe your, your question uh, relates to a um, conversation last session uh, that talked about us oftentimes being able to bill accounting for work that we needed to do. Uh, this doesn't contemplate that, um, it's, it, it, and it only provides us concurrent jurisdiction for prosecution, prosecutorial purposes. And in fact, in view of the fact that we don't have investigators who would be the ones doing primary work on that, we'd be working in tandem with local law enforcement uh, and uh, uh, district attorneys to the extent there's a, an opportunity for joint work in that regard as well. Uh, so this wouldn't, this, this would not be in lieu of what we discussed last session, uh, but the iteration of this particular bill contemplates um, concurrent jurisdiction and working together. So just for simplification, clarification, you would not be billing the counties 
if, with this bill. Th that if is correct. If it passes and you have this authority now. Aaron Ford, for the record, that is correct. Thank you. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for that clarification. Members, any other questions? Not seeing any, thank you so much for the presentation. I'll invite you to take a seat back and we'll invite anyone to the table that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 50. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Monroe Marino and the committee. My name is Beth Schmidt. I represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We support SB 50. LBMPD currently investigates the vast majority of organized retail theft crimes in the state of Nevada. We handle almost all of the big cases and certainly everything in the southern part of the state. We support this bill. We support the additional assistance to work in tandem with the AG's office. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Paul Moratkin for the, uh, with the Vegas Chamber. Chamber is support of this bill in the Policy Committee and also in this Money Committee. We believe it's an appropriate preparation to help address the organized crime uh, situation that we have throughout the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not seeing anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in support. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 50? Not seeing anyone. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 50? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 50, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Brian Walker, Senior Vice President of the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, I want to thank you for the time this morning for hearing Assembly Bill 50, and I want to thank the Attorney General and his staff for working uh, with the Retail Association to be able to present to you Assembly Bill 50. Uh, for the fiscal concerns, I uh, just wanted to put into context, uh, it has been uh, testified that about $800 million uh, in retail goods are stolen uh, from Nevada retailers uh, throughout the biennium, which um, brings it to about $120 million in lost sales tax um, at all levels of government, just shy of a $13 million in lost sales tax uh, to the state general fund. Um, we believe that the money that you are allocating to this position in the attorney general's office uh, will allow us to reduce that amount um, over time. Um, the current uh, appropriation that you have in front of you is a little bit less um, than we had originally requested to fully staff the attorney general and make the biggest debt we could. Uh, but we believe that this appropriation is going to allow the general fund um, to actually realize some additional revenue. Um, and for that reason, uh, we do support Assembly Bill 50. Uh, the policy implications, though, of reducing um, these kinds of thefts in our stores is going to increase worker safety, um, as well as the part of the bill that deals with counterfeit goods, um, not just stolen goods. And so the, being able to empower the attorney general to go after counterfeit dealers and counterfeit goods is going to keep consumers safe in Nevada. Uh, and for all those reasons, we urge your support today. Thank you so much. Next caller. Chair, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you. Coming back to Carson City, is there anyone that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 50 here in Carson City? Not seeing any. God bless you. <laughs> Not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 50? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. And then coming back to Carson City, is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide a neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 50? Not seeing any and still not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas. And if I heard correctly, there is no one on our phone line at this time, correct? Yes, Chair. Thank you so much. Then I'll ask the presenters if you have any closing remarks. See none. Thank you. We will close the hearing for Assembly Bill 50. And members, last week we had a waiver of the rules where we could work session bills on the same day that we heard them. We need to get a revised amendment.
I do have a question. Uh, Aaron Ford for the record. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. In order to work session the bill, um, the amount that was included for the appropriations was $252,189. But I believe in your presentation today, you said that amount may be adjusted. Is that the correct amount? Uh, Teresa Benitez. Teresa Benitez Thompson, for the record, to um, Chairman Ro Moreno. Um, so what we were looking to confirm with with our um, CFO was the cost for the senior DAG versus just a uh, deputy attorney general. And in reviewing the numbers on Friday, it looked like that number might have reflected a DAG versus a senior DAG. So I was just waiting for that final confirmation. Um, it's a, a holiday weekend, and um, so uh, that's the last piece I'm just waiting on was that final <laughs> nod. But honestly, at this point, we'll take what you give us. So if you just want to move it right now, whatever the number is, we'll make it work. This, um, we can work session it today with that amount. If the numbers come in at a different amount, you can always amend it once it goes to the Senate. Okay? All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, members, with that um, information, I will accept a motion to do pass as amended. Madam Chair, I'd move to do pass as amended Assembly Bill 50. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Bacchus, a second from Assemblywoman Hadegi. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously of the members present, and I will assign that floor statement to Assemblyman Hafen. All right, moving on, we'll go back to the top of our agenda um, and open the hearing for Assembly Bill 6, a measure which revises provisions relating to the cost of health care. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Monroe Moreno, members of the committee. I am Sarah Ralston here today, not on behalf of the patient Patient Protection Commission, uh, but as my own individual capacity as a commissioner and also as the former executive director. I've been asked to provide a brief overview of Assembly Bill 6 and have prepared remarks related to the intent of this legislation and more specifically on why the investment is important for the state. I will read this in so I do not miss anything and to be respectful of your time, I will then stand ready to answer any questions you may have. First, this legislation is a product of the work of the Patient Protection Commission over the last several years. This proposal has been vetted through a public process and is one of three measures the Commission voted to bring forward. This measure aims to establish a health care cost benchmark in the state and seeks to serve as a crucial cost containment mechanism for our state's budget, addressing the escalating expenses associated with health care. By implementing a benchmark, the state can effectively control costs and promote fiscal responsibility while ensuring access to quality health care for all Nevadans. In recent years, health care costs in Nevada have reached unsustainable levels, rising insurance premiums, exorbitant drug prices, and escalating medical service expenses have burdened both individuals and the state budget. This bill is asking you to proactively address these issues and to protect the financial well-being of patients and the state as a whole. As I mentioned, the main component of this measure is to establish a health care cost benchmark. It also promotes cost transparency. Specifically, the bill requires health care providers and insurance companies to report measurement against the benchmark, fostering transparency and accountability in the healthcare care industry. This transparency will empower patients to make more informed decisions about their health care choices. Furthermore, this measure promotes competition amongst, among health care providers by providing consumers with comparative information about health care costs. And most importantly, this measure serves as a cost containment mechanism. The first point I would like to make is on the budgetary control. By establishing a health care cost benchmark, Assembly Bill 6 enables the state to control and predict health care expenditures more effectively. This will help prevent unforeseen budget shortfalls and ensure the availability of resources for other essential public services. 
affordable premiums. The benchmark will provide a foundation for regulating insurance premiums by stabilizing health care costs. Insurance providers can more can offer more affordable plans, making health care coverage accessible to a larger population. Three, addressing the cost shift. Currently, higher health care costs leads to cost shifting, where providers compensate for lower reimbursements from public insurance programs by increasing charges to private payers. Assembly Bill 6 will help mitigate this phenomenon, ensuring fairness and equity in health care pricing. Last, sustainable economic growth. High health care costs hinder economic growth by placing a burden on businesses and individuals. By implementing a cost benchmark, we can attempt to alleviate this burden, fostering a business-friendly environment and stimulating economic growth in Nevada. In conclusion, Assembly Bill 6 represents a critical step towards containing health care costs in Nevada by establishing a health care cost benchmark, promoting transparency, and encouraging competition. We can protect the state budget and ensure access to affordable, high-quality health care for all Nevadans. I sincerely urge your support for this measure and recognition in its significance in improving the financial stability of our state. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation and thank you for cutting your family vacation off a little bit earlier to come and do this for us this morning. Um, there is a fiscal note on the bill and I would invite the Department of Health and Human Services, Healthcare Financing and Policy um, to the table just to address that. Um, fiscal note. Good morning. Good, mor good morning, Madam Chair. Stacy Weeks for the record, D Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. We just need a staff person to help um, with this bill and some of the requirements. An economist. Button's not working. Okay, looking at it, the $152,923, but of that, only $76,462 would actually be general fund, correct? Madam Chair, Stacey Weeks, for the record, yes, you're correct. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And your department cannot absorb that. You would need that um, amended into the bill, right? The appropriations? Madam Chair, Stacey Weeks, for the record, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Members, any questions for um, either one of the presenters on the fiscal note or the policy itself? Assemblyman Haven. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you may not be able to answer this today, but um, there's a, another bill going out um, regarding the provider fee um, where the state would receive about 15, I believe it's 15 percent of that. Um, <clears throat> with adding this uh, proposed growth benchmark, do we know what the fiscal impact uh, of the growth benchmark would be on the um, proposed provider fee yet? Madam Chair, Stacey Weeks for the record, Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy, through you to Assemblyman Hafen. Um, my understanding is that there's really no, um, what's the right word, requirements around the cost growth benchmark to actually limit costs, so I don't think it really has an impact on the provider tax. Thank you. See no other questions? I thank you both. And I'll invite to the table anyone who would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 6. Good morning. You can start whenever you want. Make sure you turn on the button, state, and then spell your name for the record. Good morning, I am Kofi Haralston, that is K-O-F-I-H-A-I-R hyphen R-A-L-S-T-O-N, and I'm here in support of Bill AB6. Um, as Winston Churchill once famously said, healthy citizens are the greatest asset any country can have. This bill would permit more citizens to have access to health care and thus contribute to the general body of our country, and I urge you to support also. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can go ahead. My name is Jordana Dibello, J-O-R-D-A-N-A, D-I-B-E-L-L-O. I support AB6 because I want to live a future where I don't have to worry about health care. Thank you so much. You can go ahead. My name is Gil Hare Ralston, and I support AB6, and I urge you to as well. Oh, G I L. H A I R R A L S T O N. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for joining us here today. Love to see the future in the room being part of the process. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 6? Not seeing any. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 6? Not seeing any. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 6? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 6, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Shelby Swords from Battleborn Progress. We are in support of AB6. Anything that helps us understand and address rising health care costs for Nevadans is good policy and a good investment for the health of Nevadans. Please support AB6. Thank you so much. Next caller. Chair, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you. Then we will go to opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 6? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good morning and happy Memorial Day. My name is Patrick Kelly and I'm with the Nevada Hospital Association. We request that this bill not move forward. In the last legislative session, the legislature created the All Payers Claim Database, which is designed to collect and store information on medical, dental, and pharmacy claims in the state. This information is needed to analyze health care costs in Nevada. Unfortunately, the database is not up and running. It's illogical to establish a health care cost growth benchmark without the information needed to set and analyze the benchmark. We've already witnessed a benchmark failure. The first benchmark was established for 2022. The growth rate was set at 3.19%. Inflation was 6.5%, double the amount of the benchmark. If the 22 benchmark was in force, there would be no new growth, only significant cuts. Benchmarking might be useful with uh, well-developed healthcare delivery systems like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Delaware, but it's not appropriate for states like Nevada that have millions of people living in federally designated health professional shortage areas. I remind you, Nevada is, among, is ranked among the top five states in the nation where healthcare is least expensive and where overall healthcare spending grew the least. We don't need a benchmarking program that constricts growth we need to expand health care. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go on, do you see anything in this bill that um, makes this mandatory if, or is it just a transparency tool and investigatory tool? During the PPC hearings, uh, there was a significant discussion about making penalizing health care providers that did not um, meet the, the um, benchmarks and that has been taken out but we went to the PPC and said look inflation is running high the governor's uh, executive order says that you have the power to adjust the benchmark to a real more realistic number and they would not do that they left it where it is so you know if they're not going to take input and look at the facts then we do have a, a concern about the benchmark thank you you can go ahead Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Helen Foley, and today I'm representing the Nevada Association of Health Plans, which is a 10-member organization, trade organization, for the commercial insurers in the state of Nevada. <clears throat> we echo uh, the concerns of, of Patrick Kelly. You know, if we think about just a couple of years ago, during COVID, uh, supply chain was very, very challenging. Uh, trying to get the supplies in hospitals that were needed to serve patients, very costly. If we had been restricted to in artificial inflationary standards that the PPC establishes, it would have been disastrous for us to be able to supply services to, to individuals. We understand that this is not going to penalize at this point, but during the entire uh, interim, when they talked about this, they talked about having uh, establishing the benchmarks and then having restrictions on everyone who supplies health services that they would be mandated 
uh, to be under that level or they would be fined. So this is just a stepping stone uh, to the rest. You have to be realistic. If we see what inflation was just a year ago, compared to now, it would have been impossible for us to get to a 3.9 percent when we were almost up to 10 percent inflation. Uh, we did have the All Payers Claims database that you passed last session. We would like to get that established and have that in working order. We would all supply our information to the state and hopefully that would be the, the right process to use. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 56? Not seeing any. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 6? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. So we will move to the neutral position. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 6, I invite you to the table. Not seeing any and not seeing anyone come to the table in Las Vegas, BPS. If I understand you correctly, there is no one on the phone line to provide testimony at this time? Yes, Chair. Thank you so much. I'll ask the presenter if you have any closing comments before we close the hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. If you don't mind, I would just like to take a brief moment. Um, I know that this is not the policy committee, but given some of the opposition testimony, I'm so sorry, Sarah Ralston for the record. Um, given the opposition testimony, I would just like to touch upon it quite briefly when they talk about an all-player claims database um, that it was an investment that this body uh, decided to make for uh, transparency in healthcare and gathering data however that is a separate data collection that we're looking at uh, with this uh, legislation and so both are equally important but when you think about establishing a health care cost benchmark um, you are right that there is no penalty for non-compliance and it was designed that way the discussions that the Commission had around this measure that involved uh, penalties for non-compliance were only in the capacity for comparing what other states have done um, to advance benchmark discussions and advance healthcare uh, policy decisions. This measure is important, as I stated before, for cost containment for a new data set collection. And so there is no penalty, I mean, there is no penalty for noncompliance because the state should have access to this set of data. So you are more informed in making decisions as you progress in your policy uh, decisions. And it also will be important for patients to see another data set on healthcare spending as well as claims. But those are two different data sets um, that will hopefully give us a bigger picture of healthcare in our state. So I just urge you to keep patience in your mind. And also, I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarity on the data component. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for that clarification. And um, again, I appreciate you taking time away from family event to come in for the presentation. And members, with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 6. And we will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 7 and invite Senator Donate to the table for the presentation. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Fabian Nanyate, and I represent Senate District 10. Uh, today I'm presenting Assembly Bill 7 in my capacity as Chair of Senate uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, AB 7 is a bill that revises provisions relating to the maintenance or an and to relating to electronic health records. Um, really quickly, so this bill was introduced by the Patient Protection Commission and the bill that you see before you is, um, I would say it's it's uh, sister policy to the provisions of uh, uh, Senate Bill 419. Um, what you have before you is a bill that essentially re rewrites the regulations that we have in place for rather than prescribing to a health information exchange, it looks at more so the exchange of health information. Um, the provisions of the bill with regards to the fiscal notes in between section 1.3 all the way to section 2, um, it establishes requirements that health providers have to start onboarding to an electronic health record. Uh, the rationale for this is, as you know, as we continue to 
increase the adoption of technology. It's important that healthcare providers are connected with one another so not, we're not duplicating uh, labs, exams, etc. And the fiscal note that you see is more so on the end of the bill. Um, on section uh, 2.5, there is a one-time appropriation of $3 million. Uh, this $3 million is to help assist smaller healthcare providers who may not have the capacity to onboard to an EHR so that they can receive the federal, uh, not the federal, the state grants that could be awarded to them to onboard onto such platform. Uh, there are uh, fiscal notes that were attached to the bill, um, but I believe those are from under the, the first for, uh, portion of the bill, and it, it's not with the reprint. So I don't know if there's anyone from DHHS that could elaborate on them, but uh, I just wanted a touch point on the $3 million appropriation uh, for the one-time use of uh, uh, awarding grants to local providers. Uh, and with that, Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for... Um coming upstairs to present this bill for us. Um, I know you are extremely busy as all the rest of us are, so I appreciate that. If we do have anyone from DHHS Aging and Disability Services who can speak to the fiscal note that was submitted and from Child and Family Services, there was a um, fiscal note submitted from both. Good morning. Good morning, <coughs> Madam Chair and the committee. My name is Heather Bug. I serve as the Administrative Services Officer 4 for the Division of Child and Family Services, and we have a fiscal note on this bill. Um, currently, the division has an electronic health record system, but it does not connect into it in exchange. And so to comply with the bill, we would need um, contractors to apply the interface and a um, um, a bi-directional interface to connect into a health exchange. And if I read um, the fiscal note correctly, that would not be an FY24-25. That would be a future cost for Correct. future buying Correct, to, to be um, implemented by January 1st, 2028. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Ellen Cresilius, Deputy Administrator for Aging and Disability Services Division. We're in a similar situation as DCFS. We would need um, basically contractors for a one-year time period for information and the data gathering process and to work with our current vendors to connect to an HIE. We currently are not connected and we have four separate systems that would need to connect. So there would be one-time costs in addition to ongoing costs. And the one-time cost, would that be in this biennium or in future bienniums, and then would future costs pass that? Ellen Cresilius, it would be in future biennium. Members, any questions for the presenter or for our um, presenters from the health department, from DHHS? Not seeing any. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll invite anyone to the table that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 7. Not seeing anyone here in Carson City. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 7? Not seeing any. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 7? Chair, the public line is up and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you. Coming back to Carson City, is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 7? Not seeing any. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 7? Not seeing any. And BPS, if I understand it correctly, we still do not have anyone on the phone lines. Is that correct? That is correct, Chair. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll ask the presenter of the bill, do you have any closing comments? Thank you so much, Chair. Fabian Dignato for the record. Um, perhaps I may need some clarification with any closing remarks. I don't see anywhere in the bill where it would require them to operate with a health information exchange. From my understanding in section one of the bill, um, it strikes that the provisions of, so it's section one, 
subsection 1B, it strikes out and encourages the use of health, of health information exchanged by healthcare providers, and rather it instead reframes it that they have to prescribe new regulations to the exchange of health information. So it doesn't require you to participate within HIE, but it just says that you have to comply with what new regulations would be to help the dissemination of one of data from one place to another. And I believe the requirements are for from section 1.3 to section 2 is to have an electronic health record. So the bill, unless if I'm reading it incorrectly, would not require you to adopt into an HIE. It just says that you have to have an electronic health record. So I don't know if that's a clarification that they could answer. And perhaps I'm reading it incorrectly, but that's the only closing comments that I would have. Yeah, we can ask. Would that clarification, would that affect your fiscal notes as submitted? And if you need more time, we can do that as well. Yeah, Ellen Chrysilius, I would need more time to look back at that, but I do appreciate the clarification if that's the way, what the bill's intending. Thank you. There was some amendments, so there is a reprint of it. For the record, Heather Bug, DCFS would also need more time. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if you two could work on that and get that back to us, like, I won't say in the next few hours, but you know, it's a short week. We've got to close out the session. So as quickly as possible would be great. So with that, seeing no other questions or comments um, from the presenters, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 7, and I look forward to receiving what I hope to be amended fiscal notes on this legislation so that we can move it forward. Thank you so much for joining us. Moving on, we will open the hearing for Assembly Bill 58. Assembly Bill 58 revises provisions relating to regional commercial air service in the state. Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, Susan Fisher with McDonald Carano speaking on behalf of Nevada Aviation Association. Last week in this committee, you heard Assembly Bill 429, which also has this provision in here. I'm not speaking on behalf of the League of Cities, but very early in session, the Nevada Aviation Association worked with Assemblyman Gurr, NACO, League of Cities, and we, the Aviation Association had a bill with a $2 million request and the League of Cities had this bill, AB 58, with the $10 million request. We took the provisions of their bill and rolled it into 429. So I believe this one can be set aside um, unless there's a desire to set 429 aside, in which case this one should go forward. But you he already heard the policy provisions of this bill before. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think the only thing that... Um, for this bill members if you look at the the bill language on the added language had the monies from the general fund to remain and not revert or however if we move this bill forward it will be the chair's desire to change that language that it would revert back to the general fund any general fund appropriations to this fund so if this does get to a work session, that will be part of the amendment on this bill. Any questions? Thank you so much, Ms. Fisher. And with that, we will open the testimony for support of Assembly Bill 58. Not seeing anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 58. And I believe we've lost our fee to Las Vegas. If you can hear us in Las Vegas and you'd like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 58, I invite you to go ahead and get started. And I'll ask BPS, do we have anyone join us on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 58? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Coming back to Carson City, 
Is there anyone here that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 58? Not seeing any. Not seeing anyone on the screen for Las Vegas. I believe we've lost the feed. And knowing we do not have anyone on the phone line, we will move to the neutral testimony position. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 58, I invite you to the table. Not seeing anyone. Not having the line to Carson City and BPS, I will check one last time. Do we have anyone join us on the phone line as of yet? Chair, there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. And with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 58. And we will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 72. Assembly Bill 72 creates the Advisory Committee on the Safety and Well-Being of Public School Staff. All right, it appears the presenters for Assembly Bill 72 have not arrived in the building, so we will roll that until later in today's agenda. And we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, and that's Assembly Bill 84. 84 revises requirements for the issuance of certain annual permits for entering, camping, and boating in state parks and recreational areas. And we will invite Assemblyman Watts to the table. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Howard Watts. It's my pleasure to present Assembly Bill 84 for your consideration today. Uh, this bill was recommended from the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources, which I served as the chair as during the last interim. The bill, as it's presented, uh, sought to provide uh, free entry, uh, camping, and boating. So basically to remove all fees for use of our state parks for members of uh, tribes based in Nevada. Uh, in conversations since the bill was heard and moved out of the policy committee, uh, two issues were, were brought forward. One was um, just as, as we're also continuing to modernize some of our systems for uh, reserving campsites and other things, trying to figure out that and, and make sure that we have something that uh, can be effectively implemented. Uh, and then additionally, there were uh, uh, issues raised by some of my colleagues uh, in this body that uh, while we do have free 
entry camping and boating for uh, disabled veterans. For veterans that do not have a, a service-connected disability, there is currently no program uh, to help support their entrance and usage of state parks. Uh, the National Park Service uh, has free lifetime entry to national parks for uh, all uh, veterans uh, and, and their families. And so uh, you should have before you a conceptual amendment. I did notice while I was uh, uh, up at the dais earlier that uh, there is a typo in it. And so essentially what we're proposing is to remove the current text of the bill and add uh, instead that the administrator shall establish a program for the issuance of an annual permit free of charge, so no fees, uh, to enter each state park and recreation in this state to either one, a member of an Indian tribe that is located in whole or in part in this state, or B, a Nevada resident, so again, they have to be a resident, uh, who has been honorably discharged from the U.S. Armed Services. And it says for, and that should be from the U.S. Armed Services. And so again, um, we're narrowing it from the original intent, which was uh, no, uh, no fees for anything to just the entry fees so that people can get in. Um, and then we're expanding the universe of folks covered from tribal members to uh, Nevada residents who are, uh, who are veterans. And so uh, with that, that has changed the fiscal note um, if it's all right, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Mergel to come up from State Parks so that he can speak to that updated fiscal note, and then glad to answer any questions that members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bob Mergel. I'm the administrator for Nevada Division of State Parks. Um, so we do have a fiscal note in there as the bill was written um, with the amendment that does change the fiscal note um, uh, in a couple of different ways. The uh, moving that amount to just day use, um, we will then only be waiving the or recognizing the loss in current day use for Native Americans and uh, veterans. So that'll uh, bring the fiscal note to roughly 240 five thousand dollars annually um, and that's based on the percentage of the population that is both Native American and uh, veterans and then taking that percentage of 50 percent of our day use revenue which is brought in from Nevada residents since roughly those are all going to be Nevada residents involved in that um, so it and then without uh, Without the ability to collect an administrative fee, which is what we currently collect for um, both our um, senior permits and our disabled veteran permits. So both of those we currently charge a $30 administrative fee, but as written, this wouldn't allow us to collect that. Uh, and therefore that fiscal notes about $245,000. If we could collect the administrative fee, it, it would uh, in essence remove that fiscal note. Howard Watts, for the record, before I open it up, just a couple of things. I appreciate Mr. Mergel providing the update on the fiscal costs. So um, I just want to note for members' awareness, so um, we did the Every Kid in a Park companion bill for state parks. Obviously, there's a national park initiative. And so this uses similar language of free entry without fee to those parks. Um, you know, and, and again, recognizing that um, that the ancestors of these tribal members uh, were displaced from the lands that now make up our state parks and, and honoring the sacrifice of uh, veterans um, uh, that have contributed to help protect these places. The other thing that I just wanted to note is, and I wanna first of all just uh, recognize the incredible efforts that have been led by uh, the Division of State Parks in increasing access um, and, and getting people more interested in visiting and supporting our uh, our wonderful state parks and, and lands. And uh, uh, just for the committee's consideration, uh, recently a program was launched to provide um, park passes at libraries. Folks can check those out and go and get free entry into a state park. 
Um, and from what I've heard, uh, especially in some of our urban areas, it's been extremely popular. There's a backlog of people waiting to get those two uh, permits to go visit state parks. Um, but of course, in, in some of our rural areas and tribal communities, access to get to the library to get those uh, passes can also be a barrier. And so uh, that's another reason why uh, this is being put forward. So definitely recognize that there are a few things uh, out there that are um, that are decreasing some of the fee revenue coming into the division, but um, I feel that it's also important that we balance that with um, uh, providing access for certain communities. So with that, glad to take any questions that the committee may have. Thank you so much for the presentation. Members, any questions? Assemblyman Watts, you've mentioned some language amendments um, and those policy amendments would it um, affect the fiscal note that would be associated with the bill. So if you could get that amended language to us, and then if you could get us the amended fiscal note that corresponds with that language, that would be great. And if we could move this um, forward. And your agency would not be able to absorb this cost. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, for the record, Bob Mergel, um, that's correct. We, we would not be able to absorb that cost. And if I could just make a brief comment on the uh, library pass and the um, uh, fourth grader pass. Those were actually, it's, I love those programs, but um, they're also trying to reach out to people that aren't already using the, the parks and to kind of generate uh, new advocates for us, if you will. So there's a little bit of a difference between those permits. Right now we, we do have veterans that are using the, the parks. Um, we have Native Americans that are also using the park so a little bit different um, I guess uh, relationship there and one we're reaching out trying to get people that haven't come to parks and if uh, finances are a barrier we want to make sure that we can you know um, help them uh, I guess bridge that gap if you will so there's that's the slight difference I understand so this bill as written has a projected loss of revenue that the um, division is already receiving the other is revenue you haven't seen, so. Awesome. Assemblyman Hafen, looks like you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and um, I mean, I kind of look at this as, as trying to bring parity to the tribal lands because um, could you just confirm, my understanding is there's currently no libraries on tribal land. Is that is that an accurate statement? Howard Watts, for the record, and uh, the division can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know of any of any libraries currently on tribal land. Again, it, there's also a, a wide variance, right? You could have the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, which is located right within the Reno Sparks urban area. So that I don't believe they have a, a library on on their lands, but may have uh, reasonable access to one. Um, you know, uh, same thing with like the Las Vegas uh, uh, band of of Paiutes. Um, meanwhile, you have the you know Duckwater or, or uh, Shoshone or uh, Duck Valley tribes that may have significant distances um, to reach a library to obtain a pass. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Assemblywoman Gorlo. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was trying to do some quick research on this. Um, since you're going to be relooking at the fiscal note, and hopefully it doesn't take too much time, but could you check and see how much it would cost to also add a general discharge veterans as well? Um, I was trying to find out when the honorable discharge was started, and for some reason I was thinking the Korean War vets just had general discharges. I could be very wrong on that. I couldn't find it in my quick Google search. But um, if we could maybe... If it doesn't take much time, thank you. Howard Watts, for the record, thank you for that. Well, I'll definitely look into that. I believe this language was put in place to um, mirror some of the language that's in place for the National Park Service. So, was hoping that they that they've got it right. But we'll check we'll check in on that for sure. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions, I thank you both for the presentation and the um, comments on the fiscal note. And I'll invite anyone to the table that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 84. Good morning. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy cabrera Georgeson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Nevada Conservation League, and we're here in strong support of AB 84. We are huge proponents of getting more folks outside, and that's especially true for our tribal communities and our veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Jennifer Lanahan. I'm here on behalf of the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe and the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, and we want to thank the bill sponsor for bringing this forward, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Alex Tanchek with Silver State Government Relations, representing the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, Shoshone Paiute Tribe, the Duck Valley Indian Reservation, and the Duckwater Shoshone Tribe, also here in support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Las Vegas? and Carson City that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 84. Not seeing any. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 84? Not seeing any. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 84? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 84, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Shelby Suarez of Battleborn Progress. Regardless of where you are or where you call home in Nevada, you are on native land. This bill is a great first step in not only respecting tribal sovereignty, but also honoring the stewards and caretakers of our beautiful state. Please support AB 84. Thank you. Next caller. Good morning, Madam Chair and the hardworking um, committee. This is Dora Martinez representing the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. We would really like to thank uh, the sponsor uh, for introducing this bill, and we urge you to pass it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Next caller. Good morning. This is Rose Walterbeek, W-O-L-T-E-R-B-E-E-K. And for the record, I represent the Sierra Club. I'm a volunteer representing over 30,000 members in the Toyabi chapter. And we urge your support of AB 84. I have submitted written testimony. And I thank you for your consideration. And definitely want to give you all a shout out today for being there on Memorial Day and anybody to open any of your buildings. Um, you all are true public servants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you so much. So coming back to Carson City, we will move to opposition. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 84, I invite you to the table. Not seeing any, and not seeing anyone come to the table in Las Vegas to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 84, we will go to the phone lines. Do we have anyone on our phone line that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 84? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. And with that, we will move to the neutral position. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 84, I invite you to the table. Not seeing any. And not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas. And BPS, if I heard you correctly, there is no one on the phone lines at this time. Correct? Correct, Chip. Thank you so much. And we will ask the um, bill sponsor, presenter, if you have any closing comments. Seeing none, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 84. All right, moving on with our agenda, we will open the hearing for Assembly Bill 130.
Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Kanani Espinoza with the Roe Law Group. Um, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod is in the Education Committee next door, so she asked me to uh, send her apologies, but she um, is allowing Ariel Edwards and myself to present AB 130, and then wanted me to circle back with you and let you know that AB 72, if you did get to it today, she'll send Assemblywoman Torres over to the committee. So just let them know. Much. <laughs> Um, Assembly Bill 130 has an amendment on Nellis uh, that deletes the uh, the increase in grant allocation um, and restores the 200,000 that is previously in statute. Um, and that was submitted on uh, behalf of the Roe Law Group. And then I'll turn it over to Ariel Edwards. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Ariel Edwards, uh, Director of Government Relations for Nevada Hand, uh, here to co-present alongside Kan Kanani Espinoza <laughs> on uh, AB 130, sponsored by Assemblywoman Bilberry Axelrod. In the interest of time, the unamended version of AB 130 was drafted to address critical sustainability challenges that, uh, that our live assisted living facilities face. That version asked for an increase in the fund for a Healthy Nevada grant, which is a set aside within the Department of Health and Human Services. However, great news came out of this session earlier this month in which the Joint Ways and Means and Senate Subcommittee on uh, Health and Human Services approved to increase Medicaid rates to align with true Medicaid provider costs for provider types 57 and 59. As a result, this amendment within AB 130 retains the current grant amount of $200,000 annually rather than increasing the amount. And for the committee's awareness, AB 130 hasn't received a policy hearing just yet, which will be necessary to ensure affordability for residents, sustain quality care, ensure financial sustainability, and expand capacity for assistant living facilities in Nevada. Nevertheless, we are here to inform the committee today that this amended version does not ask for an increase of what is already allotted within the uh, fund for a healthy Nevada. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Well, it's nice to hear that something we did right this legislative session. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for the amended language. So members, there will not be the additional amounts that would need to be added to this piece of legislation. Does anyone have any questions on it? And there were no fiscal notes attached to it. Any questions? not seen any so thank you so much for the presentation thank you madam chair I'll invite anyone to the table that's here to testify in support of assembly bill 130 Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Mindy Elliott, representing the Nevada Housing Coalition. Anything that we can do to help uh, with uh, assisted living, housing, uh, we're all in support. We certainly want to thank Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axarod for sponsoring the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony and support? Not seeing any. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 130? Not seeing any. BPS, do we have anyone join us on the phone line that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 130? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 130, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Madam Chair. and. The committee. This is Dora Martinez representing the Nevada Disability P Action Coalition. We um, we thank the sponsor of this bill and we urge you to please um, pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you so much. Moving to opposition, is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 130? Not seeing any. And not seeing anyone at our table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone lines? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. 
Thank you so much. So we'll move to the neutral position. If there's anyone here that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 130, I invite you to the table. Seeing none, and not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas, and knowing that we do not have anyone on our phone line, I'll ask the presenters if you have any closing comments. All right, with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 130 and members with the adjusted amounts. I will accept a motion to amend and do pass. Madam Chair, I'd move to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 130. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Buck is a second from Assemblyman Watts. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously of the members present, and I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Brown May. Moving on on our agenda, we will open the hearing for Assembly Bill 155. 155 establishes provisions relating to biomarker testing. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. Thank you so much for hearing Assembly Bill 155 this morning. Uh, to be brief, Assembly Bill, uh, sorry, my name is Sarah Peters. I represent Assembly District 24 in Reno. Um, Assembly Bill 155 is um, a bill that would increase access to biomarker testing for indicated treatments. Uh, currently, less than 100 biomarkers are on the market available for treatments. Most of those are used to determine treatment regimes for cancer. However, there are also uh, treatments available that are indicated by biomarkers for um, cardiovascular disease, um, GI issues, um, and some newer technology coming out for related to dementia um, and uh, Alzheimer's as well as Parkinson's disease. Um, the fiscal impact is related to the requirement for Medicaid to cover these services. And I believe Medicaid is in the building. Um, Ms. Weeks is behind me and can speak to um, the fiscal note from her office on the first revision. I do want to mention that in uh, an effort to continue to work on this um, fiscal note, we have been talking about limiting the required um, coverage to only cancer treatments. However, that does put us at a limitation for those other significant treatment areas. Um, biomarker treatments are a growing, um, a growing field in pharmaceutical uh, treatments available for folks, and the cost savings can be really um, invaluable for folks, right, including the economic cost savings to them and their families because these treatment regimes can significantly reduce the time in treatment as well as the heartache um, of continuing through chemotherapies that may not may or may not work for the specific type um, of um, disease. Uh, with that, I will stand for questions. We'll invite Ms. Weeks up to speak about the fiscal note. Um, the original fiscal note, um, the bill as it was presented, was extremely high. That has been adjusted. If you could just address that. Madam Chair, co committee members, Stacy Weeks for the record, Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. Um, we consulted our medical director, our actuary, as well as um, talked to a couple other states, and we do have concerns about the original bill. It was bro too broad, in our opinion, as well as allowed for screening. Um, we have to have some cost control measures in our, we have to be able to control for cost. 
Um, so the, the current bill as drafted, um, we worked on with Chair Peters, and it does narrow the application to help us control costs. It ensures clinical and medical necessity, which is required for federal law. It also ensures that we can go, um, providers can choose a more cost-effective option as an alternative that still um, is equally capable of meeting the medical needs of the individual. Um, the current bill, as, as stands before you, has a medical spend impact of $2,190,809 state general fund for the 24-25 biennium. Um, there are some system costs that we'll, we will incur, about $155,680 for the 24-25 biennium. And then additionally, we have to pay our actuary every time we adjust our capitation rates, and this, this would cost us about $15,000 in state general fund to do that. In total, for the biennium state share is $2,361,489. The total computable, which would include federal funds, would be $6,415,270. Madam Chair, if I may, Sarah Peters, for the records, Medicaid already has an obligation to um, to cover treatments for folks as it, uh, if it's medically necessary. So there are some cases in which I believe Medicaid already does cover biomarkers. This would just expand it to ensure that families don't have to fight so hard for that um, in the event that there is a denial or that they're, um, they're outside of what Medicaid has historically been able to, to cover. Um, but the bigger impact on that is to the broader covered community, right, of um, non-Medicaid covered patients that um, requiring biomarker treatment will increase access for those who are in the private um, or self-paid area where it sometimes is more difficult to um, overcome those burdens and barriers um, to get the treatment that is best indicated for yourself uh, as prescribed by your physician. Thank you. And Ms. Weeks, would you give me the numbers again, um, the total amount and, and the amount that would be general fund yes. portion? Madam Chair, Stacey Weeks for the record, Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. So for the medical spend, the state general fund cost is $2,190,809 for the biennium. The systems cost state general fund is 155680 for the biennium, and the actuarial cost to us is 15,000 state general fund for the biennium. And the total is, of all those three numbers, is 2,361,489 state general fund, if I did my math correct this morning. Thank you so much. Members, any questions? Assemblywoman Buckus. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ms. Weeks. I'm not just not as familiar with this, but um, my question is with respect to these biomarkers and providing like um, an, like a straightforward course of treatment for those that may be diagnosed with cancer or other diseases, is there like a cost saving so that there's not a lot of treatment that is necessary? And with that, is that also included then in your fiscal note? Madam Chair, through you to Assemblywoman. Um, you can go directly to the number. Okay, That's thank okay. you. Um, we talked to our actuary, and they do not assume that this will be significant savings. Cancer treatment, yes, there are some savings associated with that. But others, they are not quite sure that there isn't, because there are services that we will have to provide to individuals. Th those cost money as well for treatment. Madam Chair, if I may, one of the suggestions, and, and it came up um, kind of late in the week last week, so I do not have a fleshed out amendment for this, but one of the suggestions from folks, who, um, uh, stakeholders, including Medicaid, was to reduce this bill down to just in requiring coverage for cancer treatment, and then in the interim, having the Interim Committee on Health and Human Services do uh, conduct a study on cost savings indicated for other treatments to look at expanding this to the broader sector of biomarker treatments. Um, I don't know if there would be a cost, uh, a, a fiscal note decrease if we did end up reducing it to just cancer treatment, but I would let Ms. Weeks respond if, if that's okay with you. Madam Chair, committee member Stacy Weeks for the record. Um, as I mentioned before, Chair Peters, we would consider cancer cost neutral. There may be some cost if we do need to conduct a study. Thank you so much for that. 
And I look forward to that amendment so we can move this bill forward. See no other questions from the members. I thank you for the presentation. And I'll ask anyone that's here in the room that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 155 to step up to the table. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tom Clark. I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Society of Dermatologists and Dermatological Surgeons. We very much support this bill. We've been working with the sponsor of it and look forward to uh, continuing that work. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in support? Seeing none, I'm going to Las Vegas. Not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 155? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 155, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good morning. This is Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y. C-O-L-E. I'm in support of AB 155 and would ask the obvious question, what's the value of a human life and what's the value of cost-efficient treatment? Biomarker testing, if you watch television, direct-to-consumer ads, is all about biomarker testing. Because many of the medications that are being promoted have specific indications based on the presence or the absence of biomarkers. Yes, these are mostly about cancer, but as we go farther into the future, we'll be talking about Alzheimer's. We'll be talking about all kinds of different forms of dementia, all kinds of different forms of cancer. We're getting smarter and smarter. Basically, we're talking about funding 21st century medicine, but we can't use a 20th century payment model. I urge you to support AB 155. Thank you. I'm sorry I can't be with you this morning. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you so much. So coming back to Carson City, is there anyone here that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 155? Not seeing any. And not seeing anyone at our table in Las Vegas, BPS. Do we have anyone on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 155? If you would like to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 155, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. Then we will move to the neutral position. If there's anyone here that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 155, I invite you to the table. Hello, Chair and Committee. Ashley Garza-Kennedy representing Clark County. And I wanted to come up in the neutral position um, just given the testimony about a potential um, conceptual amendment that could be coming forward to limit um, AB 155 to just cancer. Um, currently, Clark County and our self-funded health plan does cover uh, biomarker testing for cancer treatment. Uh, so if that amendment moves forward, our fiscal note would be significantly reduced, if not completely zero. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, in the reprint, we do currently still have a fiscal note of um, about 772,000 a year or 1.5 million a biennium. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I should also say we would love to work with the sponsor and Medicaid on a p potential study as well to look at expanding biomarker testing. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 155? Not seeing any, and not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone join us on the phone line to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 155? If you would like to testify neutral on Assembly Bill 155, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no colleagues choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. I'll ask the presenter if you have any closing comments before we close the hearing on Assembly Bill 155. 
Assemblywoman Peters, do you have any additional comments? Thank you so much. And with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 155. All right, members, we're at that time of session where we have members in two or three committees at one time, but we do have Assemblywoman Torres here now, so we'll go back to Assembly Bill 72, which creates the advisory committee on the safety and well-being of public school staff. Good morning. You should have worn your tennis shoes today. Good morning. I definitely should have worn them. Uh, good morning, committee. I am Assemblywoman Solana Torres, and I proudly represent Assembly District 3 in the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and today I am presenting uh, Assembly Bill 72 on behalf of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Education, of which I was an alternate um, during the legislative cycle. I, I will be honest, too. Um, I was asked to present this bill this morning. Um, but I, I, I do feel that um, as a member of the Committee on Education, we've thoroughly had this uh, as a policy discussion. I've had the opportunity to review the fiscal note as well. The bill before you today is a recommendation from the committee and I would like to first begin with some brief background information that explains what led to this recommendation. School safety has been a primary concern in recent years, both in Nevada and nationally. We've heard multiple instances of teachers and school staff in our state being threatened and attacked in this classroom, in the classroom. This bill creates an advisory committee on safety and well-being of public school staff. Uh, I'm going to go directly to the fiscal note now. So the fiscal note um, really just is uh, regarding the staffing um, for the advisory committee so that the committee has the, the staff that they need to carry out their work. Um, at this time, I'm ready for any questions, and I'm sure that somebody from the Department of Education is here to, as well. Thank you so much for pitch hitting this morning um, to present this. Bill, we truly appreciate that. And if we do have someone here from the Department of Education that could speak to the fiscal note, that would be great. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Craig Satuki, Interim Deputy Superintendent for Educator Effectiveness and Family Engagement for the Nevada Department of Education, for the record. Um, our fiscal note is uh, for Deputy Attorney General support during these, these meetings and also for staff overtime support for staff. Uh, the Department of Education currently uh, staffs uh, approximately 20 boards, task force, and commissions. Uh, only the Nevada State Board of Education uh, is the only board that we have dedicated staff member for. So the rest of those are staff with existing staff who are already working on other projects and other work assigned to their roles. Um, the fiscal note is not a large fiscal note. However, I do have to ask just a few questions. Is um, this a cost that your department could absorb um, through vac vacancy savings? Uh, Craig Satuki, Interim Deputy Superintendent for the record. Um, that's a fantastic question, uh, Chair. Um, ideally, we would not have vacancies and, or vacancy savings to, in order to be able to, to staff this position if we were fully staffed. And Assemblywoman Torres and all that's the, the district, how many are the Department of Education? Approximately how many meetings do you anticipate having? Is it specifically laid out in, in the policy itself or as needed? Assemblywoman Torres for the record. So the, the bill states that it has to have at least one meeting and then it's at the call of the chair. So I, I imagine too that this committee would be meeting uh, as needed as incidents occur, uh, uh, as different, um, uh, as, the, as the community sees fit, um, the, the committee would be meeting more or less frequently. And so the fiscal note would not be for hiring another person, it's just for the added duties of current staff. Interim Deputy Superintendent Craig Satuki for the Nevada Department of Education for the record, yes, it would be for extra duties for existing staff. It would not be to create a new position for staff. Perfect. Members, questions? See none. Then I will thank you both. And I'll invite anyone to the table that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 72.
Good, Good morning. morning, Donna Echeverry, President of the Nevada State Education Association, speaking in support of AB 72. <clears throat> NSCA launched its Respect Educators Act to elevate safety, well-being, and autonomy of all the educators in their work. Along with the needed changes to Nevada's Restorative Justice Students Discipline Law, NSCA proposed the creation of a Restorative Practice Monitoring Committee that included educators from across the state, including licensed professionals and education support professionals, legislators, and NDE to gain a clear understanding of the impact of the law and to ensure consistent implementation and secure protection for all students and educators. NSCA believes the Advisory Committee on Safety and Well-Being of Public School Staff will advance this important work. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 72? Not seeing any, and not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas, BPS. Do we have anyone join us on the phone line that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 72? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 72, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Shelby Swartz, and I am calling from Battleborn Progress. We are in support of AB 72. This bill is another form of funding our education system in Nevada. By working to make sure our school staff and their well-being are taken care of, we are also investing in the educational experience of our students. Please support AB 72. Thank you so much for your comments. Next caller. Chair, there are no additional callers choosing to testify this time. Thank you so much. Then we'll move to opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 72? Not seeing any. And not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line that would like to provide testimony in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 72, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no colleagues choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. Then we'll move to the neutral position. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 72, I invite you to the table. Seeing none and not seeing anyone at the table in Las Vegas, BPS, I'm assuming there is no one on the phone line to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 72. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. Thank you so much. Then we will ask the presenter if you have any closing remarks on Assembly Bill 72. All right, then members, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 72, and we will open the work session on Assembly Bill 72, and I will accept a motion to do pass as amended. Madam Chair, I'd move to do pass as amended Assembly Bill 72. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Bacchus, a second from Assemblywoman Heidegge. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously of the members present, and I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Natha Anderson. <laughs> All right, going to the last bill on our agenda for today. Um, we will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 304, which revises provisions governing certain special license plates. And we'll invite the presenters to the table. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, Todd Inglesby, President of Professional Firefighters Nevada. Uh, this bill uh, simply uh, changes a requirement requiring us to show proof of membership uh, through the PFN uh, on renewal so we can do it online. So hopefully saves people from going inside. Uh, there was a physical note on there, uh, but the DMV has removed that since. And then Mindy is here to talk about the amendment. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer any. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam. 
Chairwoman Monroe Marino and members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Mindy Elliott today representing myself. But I'm also representing those individuals that are in need of a life-saving transplant, skin graft, cornea, the list goes on. First, we want to thank Assemblywoman Anderson and the professional firefighters for allowing us to amend AB 304 with our simple amendment. By way of a brief, brief background, I am sure that many of you are already registered with the DMV with the donor heart designation on your driver's license. Thank you, Danny Thompson. You might wonder what happens next. Currently, the revenue from the Give Life license plates, which you have probably seen, are totally funding the donor registry database. DMV collects the data and passes it over to the donor registry, which is maintained by the Nevada School of Medicine. The reason for the amendment, DMV has a minimum requirement of 1,000 plates in order for them to continue making the specialty plate. Currently, there are 950 Give Life license plate holders. I have a commitment from the Nevada Donor Network that they will be making a concerted effort to increase the number of plates. But in order to do that, we need a waiver so that the new plates can be issued. The amendment as presented and reviewed by DMV will provide a waiver of the 1,000 plate requirement for plates issued under NRS 482.37905. On a personal note, my father was the eighth heart transplant recipient in 1968 at Stanford Medical Center. And also my late husband, Steve, was a donor. Um, I was going to order a plate uh, to honor both of them, and after one phone call, I knew the answer, but it was too late to work with the legislator to identify a BDR. So here we are today with this wonderful Assemblywoman Anderson and this wonderful committee asking for an amendment so that we can continue this life-saving work for all Nevadans. I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm, op um, I'm available for any questions. Thank you so much. So your amendment um, simply adds NRS 482.37905 to the statute, correct? For the record, Mindy Elliott, uh, that is affirmative, Madam Chair. Assemblymember Anderson, and uh, thank you so much for bringing forward that amendment. The amendment does not make any change to the fiscal note, and so because of that, if you would like me to present that as a personal amendment, I'm more than happy to do so, and I'm sorry I did not come down to make that statement right away. That is okay, and that would be perfect. Thank you so much. So with that, members, are there any questions for any other presenters on this piece of legislation? And if I could also make one more comment, Assemblymember Anderson, I also wanted to thank Chair Watts. Uh, for the work that he did on growth, growth and infrastructure on this. Um, I know that there was some discussion uh, during the time that this went through about this amendment and the timing was just off, but I just wanted to thank also Chairman Watts for the work that he did after it got out of growth and infrastructure on this very item. Assemblyman Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson and Ms. Elliott for uh, for presenting this. And yes, uh, this this came up a little bit later as the bill was almost mo was moving forward, and we had a little bit of a mix up, so it didn't get in in the policy committee. But uh, I just want to make it clear that it has my full support, and so look forward to getting this incorporated as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I thank you, and I will ask the DMV to come up and just to address and get on the record the changes with the fiscal note. Hello, Chair and Committee Members. Sean Sever from the Nevada DMV. We can indeed remove the fiscal note to AB 304 due to the minimal computer programming. Although we are neutral on this bill, it actually aligns with our goal of keeping people out of our offices. It's not that we don't want to see everybody, <laughs> but uh, it does ease the pressure if um, people go online. There's also no imp fiscal impact to the DMV on the exempting the donate life license plate requirement to uh, meeting the minimum number of plates each year. Thanks. Perfect, thank you for that. This is indeed a miraculous session. This is like the second or third fiscal note that's been removed by the DMV that doesn't happen <laughs> all right 
With that, I'll invite anyone to the table that would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 304. Not seen anyone here in Carson City and not seen anyone come to the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 304? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 304, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers she's been testified this time. Thank you so much, and we will move to opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 304? Not seeing any, and not seeing anyone at our table. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line at all at this time? Yes, Chair. If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 304, please press star, or I'm sorry, in opposition to Assembly Bill 304, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Then we will move to the neutral position. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 304, I invite you to the table. See no one coming to the table here in Carson City and not seeing anyone go to the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line that would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 304? If you would like to testify neutral on Assembly Bill 304, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits 900, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Madam Chair, I apologize. This is Dan Musgrove on behalf of on behalf of the Nevada Donor Network, and I meant to obviously um, unmute my phone during uh, support testimony. If it's if it's right with you, Madam Chair, could I provide testimony and support? Yes, you can go ahead, and we'll move it to support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Dan Musgrove uh, representing the Nevada Donor Network. I apologize. If I'm en route, and uh, uh, sorry, I can't be with you right at the moment. Nevada Donor Network wants to um, absolutely support this amendment. The work that the uh, UNR and the Donor Registry does cannot be stressed enough. It is so important that we have this information available. As you know or may not know, there are over 600 Nevadans waiting for uh, the precious gift of life and over 100,000 Americans that um, need a donor. and. The work that Nevada Donor Network, the, the DMV, in assisting us with this uh, is is so important to this process of matching organs to donors, and um, it, it is such important work. And we want to just thank uh, both the sponsor of the bill, uh, Assemblywoman Anderson, Chair Watts, who's um, Nevada donor resides in his district, and he's been a super supportive of Nevada Donor Network and all the uh, legislators who support this bill. We support the amendment and hope that you'll pass this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next caller. Sure, there are no additional callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. We'll ask the presenters if you have any closing comments. All right, seeing none. Then we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 304. And during the testimony, there was an amendment. That amendment will be presented as a floor amendment. There is nothing else that addresses the fiscal note. So we can go ahead and open the work session on Assembly Bill 304. And I will accept a motion to do pass. Madam Chair, I'd move to do pass Assembly Bill 304. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Bacchus, a second from Assemblywoman Hadegi. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimous of the members present and will assign the floor statement to Assemblywoman Anderson. And members, that's the last bill on today's agenda. And that brings us to public comment. 
Again, I'll give the number. Our number for public comment is 888-475-4499. Our meeting ID is 819-9064-1751. And then please press pound. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony, would like to provide public comment, I invite you to the table. Uh, not seeing anyone come to the table here in Carson City. If there's anyone in Las Vegas that would like to provide public comment, I invite you to the table. Not seeing anyone approach the table in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone join us on our phone line that would like to provide public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you so much. And members, that brings us to the end of today's agenda. It was kind of a short agenda. We, weren't, we will not be doing a group of work sessions today, only because we have a long night ahead of us and a really big bill, and this gives you guys time to review that bill before our hearing. But this will be the last easy day. We will be working our little tootsies off for the rest of this week to get through all the bills in our committee. So with that, this meeting is adjourned.